my name is Lisa Emerson and this is my lesson for you um, about one of our developmental theorists and the theory that he is responsible for building and sharing with the world. Um, this is for our Florida Southern College EDU 1107 course and as all of you know the task we were given was to research a theory and the theorists who developed it and I think this is a great task because basically we're jigsawing a, which is a great strategy to use within your own classroom um, so we each research a little bit of developmental theory and we share with each other um, so we don't all have to do all of the research for all of the theories um, which is great so I hope that you guys learn a little bit about um, one of the theories here today, and I look forward to hearing and learning from you. Thank you so much, and without further ado, we're going to jump right in. So today I'm going to be talking to you about social interaction theory that was developed by Lev Vygotsky um, in the early 1900s around 1930-ish, um, we are going to actually start the session off with talking about Mr. Vygotsky's background a little bit so you have an understanding of who he was. So who was Lev Vygotsky? He was Russian born in 1896 and he passed away in 1934 at the age of 37 from tuberculosis. He graduated from Moscow University with a law degree, which is great because most of us in this um, class know the experience of starting off in one profession and moving into another, which is what he did throughout his short life. After World War I, he was very active in social transformation and also within the Bolshevik government. He was asked um, to become a research fellow with the Psychological Institute of um, Moscow, which is, is where he completed his dissertation in 1925 and became the de development psychologist that we know. In the early 1930s, he was influenced by the German-American Gestalt um, psychology movement and one of the primary things that he he believed was that play in young children was equivalent to the unity of emotional, volitional, and cognitive development. And he took all of those ideas and introduced what he called the zone of proximal development, or the ZPD. And that was the backbone of his social interaction theory. So without further discussion on Mr. Vygotsky, let's go into what is social interaction theory. Sometimes social interaction theory is known also as social development theory. Social interaction in and of itself by definition means an exchange between two or more individuals. Vygotsky's theory is that um, social interaction actually plays a very big part in the fundamental role of learning. And when we say that, what we're basically talking about is that he believes that cognitive development actually originates in social interaction, that we actually process our social experiences into and use them as our building blocks for higher learning, and that any skill range that we develop is going to by using the knowledge of other people is going to exceed any skill range that we could ever acquire alone. Social interaction influences many things in our life. It influences what we think about in that um, we tend to utilize our own personal experiences to learn other things. Um, it also influences how we think about those things because we all have biases based on what information we currently have and are aware of. It also affects our higher mental functions because 
basically our social interactions are either going to stagnate if we hang out with a bunch of people that are not smarter than we are, or they're going to grow tremendously if we hang out with people who are smarter than we are. Social interaction also influences language development, basically the different types of communication that we have. Our outward communication, our outward speech, that is how we express ourselves to others. Our self-speech, which is how we talk to ourselves, which usually happens during like when we're alone and we're talking ourselves through a process. And our inner speech, which is that voice that is inside our head. Now, the process of so social interaction is actually the premise that there is a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step process to go from social interaction to mastering a task. So the first step is seeing where you observe the things around you, like a baby watching their parents read to them. The second step might be that young child reading with their parents. And the third step would be the young child independently reading on his own. Now we're going to talk about the zone of proximal development. So what is the zone of proximal development? I've included two graphics here to help explain um, exactly where the zone of proximal development lies in relation to our ability to, to learn. The, the actual zone of proximal development is defined as the difference between what a learner can achieve without assistance and what they can't do at all. So in both of those, in the middle section, you see what a learner can do unaided and in the top graphic, I really like it because it explains it as a comfort zone, which we all are very familiar with. And then that next ring out, which is actually the zone of primor, uh, excuse me, the zone of proximal development. That is where the learner can do things with guidance, with help from the person who knows more than they do. And that third ring out is the ring that the learner can't do at all, even with help. So you can see that um, that inside ring, that comfort zone, and then that learning ring, which is the zone of proximal development, and then that outside ring, which is the anxiety zone, because you can't do that task at all without help, even with help. Um, what, a ch what a child can do in cooperation today, he can do alone tomorrow. That is the quote that Lev, Vis Vis Lev Vygotsky, excuse me, um, said that really hit home with me. I think that's great to understand that um, anyone who can do something in cooperation can learn how to do it al alone. And I like to think of the ZPD as the sweet spot where learners are growing with assistance of a more knowledgeable other, which is another term that Lev Vygotsky coined. Um, it's known as MKO. It is anyone who can teach someone else how to do something because they already know about it. The ZPD is actually a moving living thing that you know you start with what you can do you learn with someone else and then you can do it independently and that becomes your comfort zone and then you learn something harder with the help of somebody else and then you can do it independently and you can then put that also into your comfort zone so it, i like to to think of the zpd as something that is moving and growing with us so if you look at it like a circle and a like a revolving growth outlook. If you look at social interaction with a more knowledgeable other, you're going to be learning and doing cooperative stuff and you're in that zone of proximal development. And once you gain that knowledge, you then can put yourself into understanding and you have a new mastery of a task or skill 
then you move back into a social interaction with somebody who knows more about something else and back into that zone of proximal development, back into the mastery and so on and so forth to keep growing even um, well beyond childhood. I think this applies to everybody throughout their life. Some examples are when a baby learns to eat or learns to crawl or when a baby learns to walk. A child can learn how to ride a bike with help. A child learn, learns to read, which we all are very comfortable understanding that one. A teenager learn how, learns how to drive a car. That's a scary one. And like us, when adults learn about foundations of education, all of those are examples of people using social interaction to learn within the zone of proximal development. So you wonder, what kind of do, how can I use this in my classroom? So some classroom applications for you. If you want to think about how you run your classroom, there are several different ways that, and strategies that you use to help your students be successful. One of the strategies we use is reciprocal teaching, and that's often large group, and we are all working together and we're all asking questions and we're summarizing and we're clarifying and we're predicting and it's when the teachers and the students collaborate until the learners are all successful. Another example is scaffolding. When you put those scaffolds into place, those, those um, helps, those guidance, those, those giving them little bits of information until they can do it themselves. Scaffolding works great and it is definitely an application that works very well with social interaction. And the final one is collaborative learning, which is an example of that is peer-to-peer -peer or group work that the strong people in the group help the less advantaged learners work successfully so they are in that zone of proximal development. Some questions that I'd like you to think about are, with the prevalence of social media, many learners are assuming that everything they see is true and valid. How can learners differentiate between who is a more knowledgeable other, an MKO, and who is just being sensational? How can or do you utilize your, perverse, your position as an MKO in your classroom to encourage students to work within their zone of proximal development, their ZDP, ZPD? How can and do you enable your students to become MKOs for each other to encourage their peers to work within their ZPD? And the last one, could we learn the material for this class faster and easier if we weren't in a classroom environment instead of online? So those are just a few questions to think about. I would love to hear and see your feedback on those questions after you've watched my video, and I really appreciate you taking the time to do so.